Okay, good evening, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to our um, latest and greatest uh, incarnation of our DAC, our District Advisory Committee. Uh, tonight we have a, a multifaceted agenda to uh, uh, which leads to conversations around what we're doing in the district, what we've been doing, uh, California budget, and ultimately what we plan to do in the future. So before we get going, uh, we'd like to take an opportunity to have uh, everyone introduce themselves. And while uh, Stephanie gets adjusted, we'll start over here with Director Sherburn. Uh, and then again, if we just ask politely that you introduce yourself and pass the microphone on. So uh, go ahead. I'm Heather Sherburn, the Director of Curriculum and Instruction um, and Technology Integration for Lammersville Unified. I am Vicki Beckman. I am the volunteer coordinator for the Wickland School Foundation. Brian Lucid, Mountain House CSD. I apologize, Bernice couldn't make it, so she sent me. I'm Cindy Sosa, and I work at Lammersville Elementary. Uh, my name is T. Bluey. I'm a concerned parent, so my kid's going to Wickland. Um, and I've been here 2009. The reason why I'm here, because there's changes, and. Uh, I just want to know what is being done and, and why it is happening that it is. So, Margaret Drummond, teacher at Mountain House High School. Ben Fobert, I'm the high school principal. I'm Brian Gervas, I'm the coordinator of instruction and technology. <laughs> Colin Clements, and I'm late, a uh, school board member. Kushwinder Gill, Assistant Superintendent. Alvina Kaiser, Chief Business Official. Irene was a tail Assistant Principal at Altamont, and I also have two students in the district. Esther Crocker, I'm with the Altamont PTA. Two students, three next year. <laughs> Stephanie Olson, I'm a Cuesta parent, and also I'm on the Cuesta School Foundation. Okay, so welcome again. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to break up our presentations into small segments. So the first one is actually a research article that I, I found this morning, uh, sent to me from an organization that's tied to superintendent leadership, and it's written by Michael Fullen. So those of you that are not uh, spending your career 24-7 thinking about education, there are a number of gurus in educational research. Uh, Ms. Dr. Fullen is one of them, uh, but when you hear the name Dufour, Marzano, uh, Sengi, Fullen, uh, those are the, the preeminent experts on really um, where education's been and where it's going. They're the ones that are providing a lot of research and advice to the deciders, both at state levels and at the federal level. Um, but Dr. Fullen wrote an article about called California's Golden Opportunity, but I think it really is a great context setting article to talk about where the LCAP is in its rollout, not here in Lammersville, but in terms of a monumental shift at the state and federal level, and what happens uh, when you have a federal to state shift, how it impacts people in the way they make plans. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is go over uh, and do a quick uh, small group activity and uh, discussion about that. Then I'm going to do a very brief overview of where we stand in terms of the budget and how that impacts decisions that we're making and ultimately uh, uh, the, 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 the twins that live together, uh, LCFF, Local Control Funding Formula, and its, its plan, Local Control Accountability Plan, uh, how that will be impacted here uh, locally. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about where we're at in terms of what we can consider for expansion and programs. And then ultimately, we're going to dig down or drill down deeper into that. And we're going to have two brief uh, presentations, one by Mr. Faubert uh, about career technical ed and one by Director Sherburn about 20, 21st century classrooms and what that will look like here in our district. Uh, because when you have a plan and you have big ideas and you have phased rollouts, you still have to make sure that the things you say you're doing, you're doing, and that'll appear in this article. Um, but you also have to stay focused and targeted. And then ultimately, Dr. Gill is going to review the process and the timelines uh, for this year's, which would be LCAP version 3.0, uh, as, as, as it moves forward. So that's the agenda for tonight. Does anyone have any quick questions before we jump into our activity? If you don't have the, uh, uh, Vicki, can you hold that up real quick, the article? If you don't have that article, there are some placed over there on the table. Um, 
and we'll uh, get everybody set up. So what's going to happen is uh, there are going to be two teams of seven since there's 14 people. I'm going to ask uh, that Mr. Forbear join this group here, and then we have the first seven there and the second seven here. Team one is going to read one part of the article, three pages. Team two is going to read the second three pages. It's very straightforward and to the point, but Dr. Fullen uh, calling the, uh, the golden opportunity, um, and he talks about, uh, you know, ultimately the, uh, the challenges that come with it and then the corrections that he would advise, both on the big level like the state and small level for people like us who are trying to put together a plan that has to be approved at the county level. The county has to understand its purpose and function in this so they can pass it on to the state. So uh, what we're going to do is take team one. So I'm going to start with Stephanie and go one, two, three, four, five, six. And Margaret, you are seven. Oh, you know what? With Trustee Clemens, we'll have we'll stop with Trustee Clemens. We'll start with Margaret and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If you are in the first group, that's team one. You're going to be responsible for pages two through four. Uh, you're going to read those individually. Team two, you're going to read pages five through seven. You don't need to have read either way. It's uh, just really kind of a fact-based thing. What the challenge is is that you're going to read it, and then with each, each of those subheadings. That uh, with, with subheadings that are in there, then you're going to uh, look at how to distill and summarize that, synthesize that information into something that we could easily explain and talk about. Um, and that's going to be the plan. So what I'm going to do now is pass out the assignment and review. Just quickly, here's, here is the task. The task is with your team, please read individually your team's assigned sections of California Golden Opportunity. Again, team one, sections two through four. Team two, sections five through seven. Number two, task. Re after reading, discuss the main point of each section with your teammates so you can circle up or slide around the table any way you want. Task three, on the provided chart paper, team one over here to my right, team two over there to my left, you're going to briefly summarize the sub-bullet headings that are uh, on this sheet that I passed out. And then four, you're going to have identify one team member to verbally review the team summary and set it for setting up a whole group instruction. So you're going to read individually. It should take five minutes. You're going to talk amongst your group with the section that you read. What are the main synthesized, distilled down? What is Michael Fullen saying in those sections? You're going to get together with your team. You're going to write those main ideas on the chart paper. Uh, one person's going to share out. We're going to talk about it as a whole group, and we're going to move on. Any questions on the instruction? What was that middle part? Which, <laughs> I was like, it was the middle part. Well, it's the part between the beginning and the end. <laughs> All right, so go ahead and take your time. I have one question. Yes, Mr. Faubert. So the sections on pages five through seven. So page five should start off with the three corrections. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I was, I was confused thinking I was going to get it. Start on the three corrections, page five. Okay, so the, the, the task before us is, uh, if this was a classroom objective, the skill we would be working on is synthesizing, taking a large piece of information and condensing it down to its main point in the effort to really try to understand the message that this uh, internationally renowned uh, expert on education and education systems has to say about the LCAP process that we're all living through. So. What I'd like to do now is move to the second phase of the, of, the, of the task, which is to take team one, and these are the areas we'd like you to synthesize and report out on. Number one, LCAP's theory of action, problems and corrections. Two, three problems. Three, making complexity complicated. Four, overdoing the front end process. And five, making the plan the goal. So we want to synthesize the information from the section you read in its most coherent, specific, and concise way. And in team two, the, the four areas are the three corrections, step one, step two, and next steps. So you have uh, approximately eight, seven or eight people in your group. 
What I'm going to ask now is some people move around the table or move out into this, uh, the crowd, but spread out, circle up, talk a little bit about the areas that you have to report out on. And then once you have it concise and synthesized into its most coherent form in as few words as possible, uh, team one, of course, is cross-pollinated here. So what I'll do is I'll move these things. Team two will stay here. Team one will move over there. And then you can write out, and then we'll share out. Any questions on the direction? This didn't say three. So step three is to write it on the, on the thing. No, no, on here. No, on here. So let's bring everybody back uh, to the idea. And again, we need to talk into the microphone. So um, education is a complicated science. It's also a complicated art. And we are living through the biggest revolution in education. Probably... Uh, because of the technology revolution and the global economy and uh, the way that technology impacts kids versus adults, varying age levels, it's really probably the most complicated era of change, in, um, at least in the last 50 years. Uh, and I can't imagine uh, any other era going through all of this simultaneously. So again, a reminder, we shifted the budget and the way schools are funded while we shifted the plan while we shifted the standards and we shifted the expected outcome of the instructional practices simultaneously between 2012 and presently. So it is a heck of a challenge, uh, but I think Dr. Fullen did a really good job in this uh, research statement uh, to put it in a nutshell about a realistic way of looking at where we're at now. So if I could ask the uh, spokesperson for Team One to identify themselves, Irene Bustatil, uh, take your microphone. If you lost it, there's one over there. And if, if you could stand by your section over there with us. And, and, and the, again, with team one, the areas are LCAP's theory of action, problems, and corrections. Three problems, making complexity complicated, overdoing the front end process, and making the plan the goal. Irene. All right. So overall, the focus throughout, they just kind of kept resonating, was that we need to keep it simple and focused. We don't need to get bogged down by rubrics and the process itself. Um, to implement the plan successfully, we need to make sure that we have understanding across all stakeholders, from our students all the way to our superintendent and back down again, that basically our, our goals, we should have the same understanding throughout, that it shouldn't get diluted as we go work our way to our students or vice versa. And that when we're gathering input from all of our community members, our students, our parents, our teachers, our staff members, that we need to do so um, with a, a discerning lens so that we're not you know, gathering so much input without a focus so we're trying to serve everyone simultaneously. And that we need to focus on goals, not compliance. So in other words, do what we say we're going to do and be able to explain how we did it. Correct, because basically if you're working towards the goals, the compliance is naturally, sorry, Alina, sorry. <laughs> This is a rough meeting. <laughs> All right, team two. Um, who is the spokesperson for team two? Mr. Faubert. Okay, um, this section talked about three corrections that we need to make as we move forward in the LCAP process. Um, and the overall focus is on the goal and not the details. So there were three main steps within this process. The first is, here's the goal and why. And one of the specific things it talked about was, if you couldn't answer the question, why is that goal, and back it up with data, then you need to keep asking the question until you figure that out. The second step was to actually describe the plan and how the specific things that you'll agree upon that, that will show progress. And the third step was to agree on transparency and monitoring, which meant how are you going to report out as you go forward um, on, those, on that plan. And then after that, talked about next steps, which was um, learning from each other access the uh, consortia that uh, exists to share best practices um, and look at other people. Sometimes the best way to get ideas about your own plan is to look about uh, at what other people are doing um, to achieve more results and plan more action. 
Thank you. So uh, we always like to uh, acknowledge the speakers. So uh, Mr. Mr. Faubert and Mrs. Bustill, if we could give a clap on the count of three. One, one clap at the count of three. One, two, three. Well done. All right. So the big idea here, the question was, is what is Michael Fullen saying about the LCAP and plans in general? Does anyone have a way to kind of take these two very brief presentations and consolidate it into one idea about what Michael Fullen is saying, again, about the LCAP and plans in general? while talking into a microphone. I'll let you ponder that, that question for a moment. 11 seconds is appropriate wait time. Thank you. Dr. Gill? Keep it simple and make sure all stakeholders understand what is it about and implement what is written in there. Would anybody else like to add to those two comments? Okay, so on the count of three, thank everybody for working so hard on that. One, two. Alvina. That was, I, okay. <laughs> three. All right. So I'm going to switch over now after uh, I want to thank everybody for their participation in that. Um, I'm going to give a budget overview. I'm going to do it uh, briefly in the context of Dr. Fullen's article. And pretty much everything that you see uh, for the rest of this evening is really about fine-tuning our focus. So um, again, monumental. It's a most amazing time to be in education. It's very creative. It's very change-oriented. If you're an abstract thinker, it's the best place to be. If you're a linear sequential and you like things as they have been, uh, there's a book out there called Who Moved My Cheese? Um, and they're probably feeling like their cheese has been moved an awful lot. So uh, the things we consider when we do a budget, and this is just a list of them, but if you take a look at all the dynamics there, um, there are a lot of factors that can, are, have to be considered with the new LCFF funding formula, with the limited resources that we have, with the big ideas that we want to accomplish, and how do we do it all in a sustained way uh, with that focus, with that relentless determination to make sure that what we're doing is being done, and if it's working, we know, and if it's not working, we know how to fix it or how to move on to something new. Um, this is a ranking sheet, and I'll just give you one uh, shot there. Oh, I do that every time. Um, we are not funded well in the, in the governor's program. So real quick, LCFF is about taking care of low-income students, English learners, foster youth, and then every other student in California. It's not a bad plan. It's a plan about trying to take care of those who have the least and who those who have in the old system uh, were taking care of the worst. So it's a well-intended plan. Uh, our demographics and our community have us very low on the uh, threshold of, of how the, the money is rolled out. Uh, very quickly, there is a general grant that all students receive. There is a supplemental grant for English learners, foster youth, and low-income students. And for uh, districts with high numbers of those three areas, 55% or more, you get additional funds. So what we have to do, because our funds are, 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 not, are not limitless, um, and because of the list and rankings where we fall, we have to keep three things in consideration all the time. What are the personal and professional needs of our staff? What are the demands of our community? And our community uh, wants the best in all ways in a well-rounded, whole-child environment. And then we have to plan and prepare for new schools. Uh, finishing Mountain House High School, Hanson Elementary, and I will tell you now, uh, Tradition Avenue or traditional, Tradition Boulevard, which sits over by the, the uh, fire uh, station, is going to be blocked off uh, sometime this in the month of March because they're going to begin moving dirt in neighborhood D. So as we're like sweating about how to, what to do with Hanson, neighborhood D is in play in a couple of weeks. So all three of those things have to be constant in our consciousness constantly. Okay, so here's really quickly the governor's uh, 
budget process. It's very complicated. It doesn't align with school systems well in terms of its timing. But there is a, a proposal. Uh, we do a first interim report based on student numbers called ADA. He submits in January a proposal. The proposal this year is a good one. Uh, tax revenues are higher than we thought. In March, there's a second interim report where the district responds to the governor's proposal. In May, there is a revise to make sure the tax dollars promised um, and believed to be coming in did, in fact, come in. And then somewhere in June, the, the legislature is supposed to adopt a budget. And in good political times, that happens in June. And in bad political times, that has drawn out for a very long time. At present, because there is not a super majority of Democrats, but a very large number of Democrats, and Governor Brown is a Democrat, they've been passing a June budget, and that cycle has been and pretty consistent. So we can, we can expect that that uh, would happen. So the governor's proposal uh, is a total amount of $71.6 billion for the education budget. That's a lot of money. Um, he increased the LCAP uh, contribution, $3.2 billion. If you notice, there's an asterisk. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, per pupil spending is going to average, hello, uh, is going to average $10,591 per pupil or an increase of $368 per student. That's the really good news on the average. In our district, because of our demographics, our numbers of ELs, low income, and foster youth are very low. Therefore, we will not come close to getting the state average of an increase of additional funds of $368 per student. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that we have to wait to get a final number. Our number will go up from what he promised in his budget, but it's not going to be what most people are celebrating right now because 368 per ch child is a lot, and we're going to get a lot less. Um, he also added $1.2 billion in one-time money in our conversations around LCAP school programs. One-time monies buy things. Ongoing monies pay for people. So when you hear one-time money, think of computers, think of trainings, think of things like that. When you see ongoing, you can think things like raises and you can think things like new positions. Uh, and then finally, the asterisk is what the governor did in the $3.2 billion there at the top is he didn't just add $3.2 billion to this year's allocation. He shrunk down the amount of years to roll out to cap the full amount of LCFF. So what was going to take four years is now going to take two years. So though that's a big number, it doesn't really add more money. It just gives the money earlier. Uh, so his plan is uh, once the LCFF L is completely capped, that means when he fully has allocated the funds to what he promised, then school districts are going to live off of cost of living adjustment or COLA. That's the old system that most people are familiar with. That's been around since 1972 which was the last time they revamped the budgetary process after the Serrano case. That was called equalization. So COLA is different. It's cost of living. So if the budget is good, then money comes in. If the budget is bad, money doesn't come in. And that's what he has promised as he moves forward. He leaves office in 2018. There'll be a new governor who knows what their uh, philosophy on this is. But for uh, the time being, through 2018, that's what we're looking at. The other thing is he's talked about is the California economy is in very strong uh, position right now, uh, but he has also pointed out that there are indicators in the world economy and the national economy that there is some slowdown factors. So a recession in California comes quick, it comes hard, but we also recover quicker. So uh, he predicted this and next year we'll not see any recessionary times, but he does say that school districts should keep that in mind. Two other funding concerns, uh, in November of 2016, Prop 30 expiration uh, occurs, and there is a, a proposition that uh, is on the ballot to be extending of a tax, I'll explain in a second, and the California Teachers Retirement System contribution. So very quickly, I'm not going to go into this whole chart, I'll just simply say, uh, with the expiration of Prop 30, which is a temporary tax during the budget crisis, uh, if it's not extended, we're going to end up with a loss of revenues uh, from that tax, which was a sales tax and uh, an income tax of about a million dollars ongoing. And the second concern is the state teacher's retirement system, which is uh, the uh, deficit for CalSTRS and CalPERS is massive. Those are corporate investment houses that keep track of people's retirements. They have to make money to keep the, the system solvent. 
So they decided to pass this on to school systems. Every school system in California, public school system, will have their contribution increased from this amount of percentage per employee that is uh, in CalSTRS to this amount by 2021. So that's a, a significant increase of 11.73%. And the, the amount of money that is going to be taken out of our LCAP, uh, I'm sorry, the RLCFF allocation is over $2 million. So when we think about spending money, we have to pay attention to what happens in Sacramento. So Sacramento runs this education system with, with total control. They make the decisions, they pass out the mandates, they say what you can and can't do. And though we have local control now, these are the kind of things that they do. And I, I say they give it on one hand and they take it out of your back pocket with another. And that's an example of, of an impactful thing. So we're still waiting for development here. Uh, if you drive over the hill, corporations are, are alive and well, chambers of commerces, uh, Lions, Kiwanis, clubs, those kind of things are available, and, and we have the foundations to, to, to support our kids, but we don't have a downtown. Um, in the short run, that's an impact. In the long run, when those are buildings and people, uh, we'll be able to work more with, a, with a, a local business structure to help support programs. So what does life under COLA look like? It's very simple. You get a cost of living adjustment, you subtract your liabilities, and what you have left, you have for people, programs, and plans for new schools. So our liabilities in a normal system is the structure of pay for our teachers and our staff, which we call step and column, which is anyone who gets a year experience more or gets units past their degree that qualify for a raise get about a 3% raise. Um, that's a liability to a COLA. Uh, then there's things that the, we have to do, like mandated cost insurance, utilities, and the like. Uh, the STRS contribution, those three are all have-tos. Those will all eat away from any COLA once the LCFF cap has been reached. And if Prop 30 doesn't, does not get extended, then that will be another thing. So as if, if the state says, hey, we're going to give everybody a 5% COLA, it's not really 5%. It's really what, after you subtract those things, that's what you have left over for people, programs, and plans for new schools. I want to compliment uh, Dr. Gill. Uh, Kevin Seamus, Mr. Gervas, they all happen to be sitting together. Uh, they are the, the, the people who drove the $518,000 career technical ed grant that we, we, we earned last year. Uh, Dr. Gill, working with other districts in the county, uh, brought us in another $309,000 in grants. Uh, we have a lot of little small ones, ten, seven, ten thousand dollar $10,000 grants. But all that money um, is money made available through a grant system. Uh, at the state, and we are going after that money. So $827,000 in a small district such as this, as this is a huge, um, huge amount of money. Usually you get like $35,000, $65,000. So uh, excellent job by uh, uh, Dr. Gill and, and others. So in the uh, time period between 2013 and 2016, uh, there was a strategic plan, LCAP 1.0, LCAP 2.0. So these are just some things that kind of came along the way. Uh, those were massive efforts. Dr. Fullen would say that a lot of focus on the front end on that part. Um, where we're at now is we have a board approved, county approved LCAP, and what we're looking at is uh, for additional expenditures of that one-time money in particular, what are some programs that we can look to expand? Um, so the LCAP will help us define the, what the money is allocated for for existing programs. Most of what we're going to be able to do on the big scale, the big ideas, will be phased rollout. The priority in the discussion is, is what are we doing that articulates? In other words, it's better to have a program that impacts kids up the system or a program that feeds into another program than it is to have something done in isolation and have you know, uh, uh, individual programs that don't tie to each other or tie to the district's overall purpose and goals. Um, and we will continue to measure, and uh, in a few minutes I'll pass out the measures that we have for our LCAP, um, but you have to t have the kids tell us what's working and what's not working and the data that we collect from their efforts. So what, this is kind of the overarching point is we have money to do what we want to do. We just can't, we don't have money to do everything that we want to do. So we have to prioritize, we have to think through um, what works within the system, keeping in mind the personal and professional needs of our staff, the, the program demands of the community, and the expectation and the, and the, the fact that we're, we're building schools every three to four years. So those things will um, essentially drive uh, the decision-making process. Um, one of the exercises that uh, Heather Sherburn's gonna run us through is, is what does a 21st century classroom look like in our district? 
Um, we are looking at curriculum, whether it's something we purchase or the things that we use, and how does that align to 21st century expectations? Um, how do we go about looking at when the kids tell us it's working, and how do we go looking about things when kids tell us it's not? And ultimately, we just have to keep having this conversation, whether it's in a group like this, um, or public forums at school sites, or some of our other committees like the Gate Arts and Music Committee, and just keep talking and talking and talking until we just keep focused on what do we want to do and how are we going to use the limited resources that we have as smartly as we can. The line I like to use is, we only get to spend that one-time money once, so when we do it, let's make sure it meets the needs of what we're looking for. Those are some resources about the California budget, uh, if anybody's interested in looking those up. So quickly, uh, programs and initiatives that are being analyzed right now in terms of the LCAP 3.0 uh, for potential U, uh, expansion or continuation. We have two looks at a textbook adoption. The focus is ELA, ELD. Uh, 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 we have a, a, a committee of teachers. We had a parent night the other night. Um, it would be very difficult, a big lift to ask uh, teachers to do two major adoptions at one time simultaneously. Um, but we are going to take a look uh, later on this spring at math. But the focus right now is ELA, ELD, music and art, uh, gate, uh, how to identify kids, how to create real advanced and enrichment opportunities, college preparedness, career opportunities, technical and technology and technically enhanced classrooms, what are the extracurricular experiences we want, and the specific topic of career technical ed. All of those things are, are, are in the dynamic, are programs we've started, career pathways at the high school that Ben will talk about in a minute um, for those funds. So where are we at right now? Um, this is kind of how it feels with the rollout of LCAP. So we have some music and just something to kind of share as a metaphor. So the idea of that is, is everybody wants to do the right thing, everybody wants to be successful, everybody's trying their hardest, but we have to be careful and not go too fast so we run into each other, or we don't want to uh, have the wind blow and have the ball move around and lose track of things. So it's uh, what Dr. Fullen said in the article that we just went through is, go slow to go fast, be focused, um, because if not, then uh, the joke is on this is that um, you run the risk of running into your teammate. So the idea is, is what we want to do is, uh, and with the feedback from the county that I'll explain in a second, is, is uh, the first effort that was made on the LCAP uh, was met with feedback from the county where they gave us 18 pages at, in four or six point font of feedback for changes and additions. And uh, Dr. Gill and Alvina met with a new county person and they said, no, actually, you need to go back and you need to simplify it and uh, get more specific to the topic. So part of that, um, that video clip was also about uh, the county's figuring out its role while we're doing our thing and the state is figuring out its role. So the three-year question that uh, Vicki asked uh, that was mentioned in the article is it's going to take a few years for all of the structures that are put into place to make sense and to work. So in the meantime, uh, if the wind blows and the ball falls, pick it up and throw it to second base. That's usually where the runner's going, right? We're going to just try to, to keep moving forward uh, with all of our best intentions and stay focused. Can you make that go? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to... Um, The data that came with our um, LCAP version 1.0 and 2.0, and if you can see the measures we put in there, it does read to the letter of the law of what Dr. Fullen said not to do, which is to have a um, massive amount of things. Uh, what I can tell you from the data is, is that on 
on the measures that were genuinely measurable, we either met or exceeded the target in nearly every case. And if we did miss the target and it was a target that we identified, uh, we missed it by a little bit. So I'm going to um, go ahead and, Corey, can you take those and pass them around? So the idea is, is uh, what we're being asked to do is we're being asked to simplify what we were asked to make more complicated with a lot of love to the county, um, they're, they're providing us a, a, some good support. Uh, but th we, we, with all dutifulness, uh, try to put as much stuff in there as possible. As the data is being passed around, I, I want to also pass around just for your perusal the feedback we got last year, which is the 18-page document and the, and, the, and the kind of feedback we got. So you can just kind of get a sense of of the serious nature that the county's taking and the serious nature that we're taking, and then just the general very simple explanation that we're being asked to take now. So what, what in, an es in essence is being asked of us is to simplify and just really focus in on the eight state priority items. Uh, remember that the governor's philosophy is very simple, is how are you taking care of your, all of your students, and how are you taking care of your, your low-income English learners and foster youth? How are you spending your money to help those groups of kids? And how you're overall doing in the program? The state has not come up with a new accountability system, formerly known as the API. The feds are backing off on the adequate yearly progress, which was their measure. And so we're kind of in this floating period where we have the ability to gather information and data, but we don't have a real overall overarching system to say how we're doing within the state structure and how we're doing with schools and school districts that are like us across the state, which was what the, was available in the old system. What we know is we have the highest test scores in the unified school districts in San Joaquin County. We know that we... Um, outperformed everybody by a significant mark in the county in reading. We know that we outperformed Livermore Unified, um, but it's, it's in the infancy, and therefore what we're able to do, um, how we're able to analyze is going to take a little bit of time. So um, in some cases in the LCAP, we put in some things that proved not to be really measurable on a very on a legitimate level. In other words, it was well-intended idea, but it just wasn't able to be done, or we couldn't gather any any specific information. So what uh, Dr. Gill um, and the team are going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to take out any extraneous thing in there that was well-intended, uh, but doesn't necessarily meet what Ben said is is if you can't explain why, take it out. Um, we're going to stay focused in on what the CASP is bringing to our world um, and some adjustments to uh, the programs that we have as they relate to CASP. And at the next DAC meeting, we'll bring back um, a more simplified version with the support of the county, uh, remembering that as we go forward, we, we approve our already approved plan as an annual update, and um, then that will go to the county, they'll approve it, and then that'll kick up to the state. And so finally, just, uh, um, oh, so I already, already spoke to that. So these are the eight priority eight items for the, for the state, and uh, this is essentially the feedback we're getting from the county is. Those are the eight priorities. So the conditions of learning, uh, state standards, parental involvement, pupil achievement, pupil engagement, school, uh, school climate, course access, and other pupil outcomes. So each of those fit within a matrix, um, but the idea is, is that... Uh, those are the areas that they want us to gather specific identified data, which are in this document. And then there's additional data in this document um, that we put in because we were being um, uh, overly uh, dutiful to meet the requirements of the state. So uh, any questions on the data itself? The core data that people are going to care about is how did we do on the CASP? How are we doing on, um, on AP uh, access and exams? The Casey's being gotten rid of, so that goes off the table. Attendance, we're like already really um, at the highest level. Um, suspension expulsion rates, things like that. 
So um, their measures are really about poverty and poverty-related uh, data, like uh, what is your middle school dropout rate? Ours is zero. So um, that's it. Corey, what was your question? Um, it's a great question. So the question is, so we're going to, so it gets picked up. You got to talk into the mic. I forgot to tell you. So I, I got the question. So the question is on walking and talking instruction. If you have a target and you don't meet the target by a lot, um, then what is, what do you do? Do you keep raising the target? And the answer is no, you readjust the target. It's an excellent question. Um, and then the real question is, is okay. So if we're looking for a particular, um, research based, um, highly regarded, highly effectful strategy, and it's not coming, then that's a conversation for the instructional leaders at the school site. So, um, so that's, that's how that works. So when you create a target, especially with the baseline, you're going to pick a number and you're going to hope you nail it. And we did pretty, pretty well on that with the exception of that one. But that just comes down to uh, leadership conversations uh, at the school site and pr professional development. Any other questions? And, and the plan is a three-year plan, so you have to have marks for uh, three years. And they have no problem with you adjusting them. Okay, so that's, that's it for my presentation tonight. I'm going to uh, turn this over to... Um, we're going we're gonna to start a little bit by talking about specific programs. We're going to start with Mr. Faubert um, and the Crew Technical Education Program. Keeping in mind that the one-time monies... And the resources that we have, um, these are the kind of programs that are articulated and that we're working on. And then we'll follow that up with an activity about 21st century classrooms with uh, Director Sherburn. Mr. Faubert. All right. Um, this presentation is something that was uh, presented earlier at a board meeting, and so there, I'm, I'm going to present a portion of this. Um, so I'm going to skip forward. Some of these are just about what career technical education actually is and the career clusters that are, are included in career technical education. I've been asked to share tonight some of the data that we have collected from students specifically about... Um, their interests in career technical education, et cetera. But you'll, you'll notice that uh, the career technical education falls in a number of different career clusters, 79 different pathways, and 16 clusters. Um, and we do offer a number of CTE program offerings at Mountain House High School. Project Lead the Way is one of our main ones that goes all the way down into the elementary school and at the high school um, focuses on engineering, biomedical science, and computer science. Um, we have a culinary arts program, and Ms. Drummond is our culinary arts program lead. We also have a Cisco Networking Academy. Um, and we do have a Pathways program menu. It looks like a lot of words because it is. Basically, our Career Pathways program is focused on allowing students to um, focus on a specific pathway while they're in high school and then be recognized similar to what you would do if you were to get a minor in your college, you know, experience, um, choose a certain number of courses to take and then be recognized upon graduation. So we were asked to give a survey to our students about career technical education and what they're currently involved in and what they may be interested in as they move forward. So currently, um, you'll notice that 54% uh, of our students uh, at the high school are uh, engaged in career technical, I'm sorry, 46% of our students are currently involved in CTE classes at Mountain House High School. So this is the breakdown of what those students are taking right now. Um, you'll notice our largest ones are culinary, um, biomedical, and I forgot to mention our digital art. Um, we are, our art teacher was just recently featured, um, by University of Southern California in their um, 
in their advertising campaign to get teachers to come and be um, educated on how to teach digital art. So she is one of the first to be certified to teach digital art in, in high school from the teacher's uh, point of view. So we do have that and some video productions classes as well. So this is what the students indicated were, was their interest after they graduate from high school, all the way from undecided up through um, more than four years and ob obtaining uh, an advanced degree. Um, you'll notice that majority of our students are planning on going on to college or university, whether that's directly to a four-year or not, but uh, the majority of them are looking for um, college education at least to uh, if not mostly four-year education and beyond. Again, this is just students and what they think. Of course, I'm th the parents will probably think a little bit differently. I think the percentage might be a bit higher. <laughs> um, so then the other thing that we wanted to ask was, what are you interested in taking in the future? Um, not just thinking about what we currently offer, but what we could offer in the future. And so these were some of their answers. Uh, you'll notice one of the largest uh, interest areas is in law and public and human services. Um, so I'm going to click forward here because you'll get numbers. It's easier to see numbers sometimes than, than bar graphs. So I'll go back really quick. Um, largest ones, again, um, media arts and communication, business, health sciences, um, human services, law and public safety and corrections. And science and te technology are the, the main big ones. Right now, we currently have media arts and communications courses. We have health science courses. Um, and we have, uh, now it's on there somewhere, science and technology of engineering and um, computer science and networking. So um, with these results, we're really looking into what is it that we want to offer in the future. Um, and see if we can create partnerships with some industry or people who are recently retired from industry to come back into working as career technical education teachers. I know a lot of people are interested once, once they've finished or have gone away from their careers in industry into going into teaching. And there are ways for in the state of California for individuals who may not have a teaching credential and gone through a teaching credential program to get a career technical education credential and teach in the schools. Um, and something that I learned recently is you don't necessarily need to have a college degree to be a career technical education teacher. So for example, especially in the law and public safety and corrections, sometimes a police officer who may be uh, retired doesn't have necessarily a degree from college, but they may have 25, 30 years of service in the police force and could come in and be a career technical education teacher. So we're looking definitely with a large percentage. It's the largest interest area, 42.8%. And we don't have any classes yet in that, uh, those areas. So we are not this school year, but the following school year planning on um, identifying individuals who may be able to teach classes in that area and starting to offer classes in the area of law, public safety, corrections, and security. So. Um, Again, we're continuing to align our programs to industry sectors, working on uh, getting uh, teacher credentialing going for individuals who are interested in teaching and for our current credentialed teachers to add on a career technical education credential to strengthen the programs that we have and to build programs in the areas of interest. So I believe those were the areas of this presentation that um, that were of interest to this meeting and where we're going with our LCAP plans. One thing that's very interesting uh, to note is that as we um, continue forward and build the rest of the high school is making sure that as we build those buildings that we build programs or we build facilities that fit the programs that are needed. And I believe that one of the priorities that we have is to, after we've done this with students, is go out to our parent community and get their feedback as to what they believe um, the program should look like in our career technical education areas as we move forward. So if there's any questions. All students took the survey. We did it during an advisory period. And so all students who were present that day took the CTE um, 
so that's 800 and what how many do we have today 880 something or 850 something 58 thanks I give Mr. Fobert one clap, one, two, three. All right, so um, <clears throat> that doesn't cover all the programs at the high school, but what you do have, also remember, we have a middle college academy going on. We have uh, making connections all over the place. We have some big ideas um, that we'd love to be able to do, but phased rollouts, the discussions around um, articulation, um, our ties with our middle school um, elective programs, with our elementary school, all of those things are gonna be an ongoing dialogue as we build forward. So that covers kind of the career technical ed, the college and career readiness piece, but um, I'm gonna ask uh, Director Sherburn to come up now. So the, the, the term college and career ready and 21st century classroom is, is ubiquitous at this point in time in the profession. It's constant. It's a constantly existing, omnipresent thing. So one of the, the discussions that we're having across the community in different forums like this is, is what does a 21st century classroom look like uh, in our district? And I'll let uh, uh, Heather take this over from here, but she's been running the, this. This, uh, this is the fifth time you've done this? Heather? Fifth time you've done this about? Probably, yes. Yes, sir. It's a great question so much so Mr. Faubert jumped in his seat. So, he, yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, so um, this year we established a relationship with Delta College and we started uh, something actually, something that's old but new to us and it's a new model um, in our area called the Early College Pathway at Mountain House High School. And so what it is is we, uh, cohorts of kids, in uh, fresh, the freshman year this year. We have 30, I think 35 kids in the cohort. They are taking classes at Delta College concurrently while they're taking classes at Mountain House High School. And these, these students will be able to earn an AA and a high school diploma at the same time. Um, many of them will end up earning multiple AAs depending on how, how much they wanna work. So yeah, um, we, we established that relationship with Delta College this school year. We have our first cohort going through. They started in the spring. Starting next year, they'll start in the fall, and we've got a cohort of about 32 students who have applied and have been accepted. They're actually receiving their acceptance letters tomorrow to start in their freshman year working towards AA and high school graduation at the same time. The, part, uh, the, the exciting part about that is that when they're taking classes at Delta and at Mountain House High School is some of those courses that they take at Delta College count also for high school graduation so they don't have to take double classes. For example, uh, junior and senior English courses articulate between the two schools and so if you take junior English at Delta College, then, did it turn off? Low battery. Um, you take English at Delta College in your junior year, you don't have to take it at Mountain House High School. It counts doubly for that. that makes a lot of sense. Yes, it does. So there's English classes, there's uh, science classes, um, and other classes, elective courses that count for double credit. Any other questions? Good, great question. Okay, so as we look at moving forward for a vision for 21st century learning, of course we still need to teach our kids all of the basics starting with transitional kindergarten all the way up through high school, but we're keeping in mind this college and career readiness, making sure students are ready for the career tech ed um, pathways, should that be what they choose. But as we think about 21st century learning and what does that really look like, what you see on the, this front screen are, um, they have five C's and they also have innovation in this particular picture. But traditionally we refer to it as the five C's for creativity, communication, critical thinking, um, collaboration, and digital citizenship. Well, that would include problem solving and innovation as part of those cycles that are up there. And the world today, for 21st century, we know that the world is changing at such a rapid pace that 
our students can't be prepared underneath the old mentality of just memorizing a lot of facts and information. They have to be prepared to think and um, uh, problem solve and to communicate in a really dynamic and ever-changing um, world that we have. And a big part of that world is using technology, not for the sake of technology, but as a tool for communicating, as a tool for collaborating, as a tool for accomplishing work. And so we need to have that happening as part of our classrooms and changing all the way along so that our students are ready to exist in colleges and, and careers of the future. So we're going to watch a little video here. These charts right here, at the center of it you see the, the circle pie chart is divided into those five C's with the 21st century learning in the center. And then we have quadrants here that says what are the physical room and resources that we need to accomplish our vision? What are the teacher tools and materials that we need in order to accomplish this vision of 21st century classrooms? What do we need in terms of research-based instructional routines and practices? <laughs> and then lastly, what do we need in terms of student actions? What do we want to make sure that we're getting out of our students? So in order to clarify, before we have you participate in this chart, we've had GATE, um, the GATE meeting do it. We've had the curriculum committee members do it. We've had um, PLC meeting do it. We've had site administrators do it. We've had a lot of groups do it. Everybody from their different lenses. And we're going to ask you to do that, trying to really step back at the big picture. All the other um, committees that have worked on it have been a little bit more focused, such as gate music and art, or um, looking at our uh, site administrator perspective, um, or our curriculum committee perspective. So your role is to really step back and look at it from the overall district big picture when we're doing that. So we want to define a little bit for you what we really envision blended learning looking like. And we are on our journey for that right now. So I'm not good at starting. Yes, thank you. It's a little definition. There are a lot of different definitions for blended learning out there. And although many of the great minds can't agree on exactly what blended learning is, one thing they do agree on is that blended learning is not the same thing as classroom technology integration. Please don't misunderstand. Rich technology integration is a wonderful thing that should be a part of all classrooms. But using technology in the classroom is not the same as blended learning, although sometimes the line between the two can get a little blurry. When teachers utilize technology, that's obviously pretty cool. It often results in increased student engagement and increased teacher efficiency, but that's not blended learning. Having students answer questions on clickers or through polling software on the web is a great way to use technology to collect formative assessment data. But by itself, that's not really blended learning. However, if we take the results of a clicker poll and post it in an online discussion with some thought-provoking questions or ask students to defend their thinking in that online forum, we move to a blended environment. That collaborative component and the shift from student-to-teacher interaction to student-to-student -student interaction shifted that situation into the blended arena. The use of technology transitions from being a great tool to the actual classroom space where the activity, sharing, and collaboration occurs. Taking a class to a computer lab to research for a paper they are writing is leveraging technology to access information and produce work. Nice use of tech, but not really blended learning. But if students are posting sections of their paper in an online forum to get feedback from peers or accessing recorded instruction from the teacher about the assignment while a small group works with the teacher to get some more in-depth instruction or immediate personal feedback, the activity becomes one that simply uses tech to one that uses a blended learning approach. See how that line blurs pretty quickly between tech integration and blended learning? Instead of spending time debating the gray areas of what is blended and what is tech integration, let's look at some hallmarks of blended learning. Number one, a strong connection between online and offline work. The work students complete online needs to have a direct and obvious connection to the work completed face-to-face -face and not simply be a supplemental or enrichment type activity. Blended learning is not sticking a student on the Oregon Trail game or sending a student to the computer for math games if they finish their work early. What a student is doing in the online environment 
needs to inform what is happening in the classroom. So Oregon Trail and online games can be a nice addition to the blended classroom if those activities are integrally connected to the activities in the face-to-face -face classroom. Number two, increased student-to-student -student and teacher-to-student collaboration and increased student control over time, place, pace, or path of learning are additional hallmarks of a blended learning environment. This increased control will of course vary depending on the age of your learner and our curriculum and standards outline the general pace through our year's content for us. But delivering content and activities online typically gives students more control over their learning. When information is online, students can access the content from home for review. Or students viewing content in class can revisit and replay that information. Students who need more time to process can take that time to really reflect before sharing their ideas in an online discussion. Teachers can post a variety of instructional materials and add multimedia to appeal to various learning styles and give students a choice as to the path they take to master a topic. Online classrooms and collaborative platforms give students more opportunity to share their thinking and appreciate the thoughts of their peers. In these environments, students increasingly look to one another for feedback as opposed to simply the teacher. One easy to spot indicator of a blended learning environment is an online classroom presence. This is typically done through a learning management system or LMS like Schoology. There needs to be an online home base where students routinely go to access information, participate in online activities, and share or post their ideas and work. The online classroom isn't just a static website where students can download handouts. The online classroom features similar activities that take place in traditional classrooms, such as content instruction, discussions, and assessments. The M in LMS is why many teachers choose to use one. A good LMS will streamline many of the daily management processes for teachers and make assessing student work much easier. Number four, repurposed time. Blended Learning uses technology tools to restructure that sage on the stage delivery method, provides opportunities for reduced student to teacher ratio, and frees up more time for collaborative or problem solving activities. Many of us are familiar with the flipped classroom model where students view instruction through a video in place of the traditional lecture or teacher whole class lesson, which often moves too slow for some students, too fast for others, and can get sidetracked by interruptions. This frees up in-class time for activities and rich concept application. Repurposing class time doesn't always have to be done, though, by assigning videos for homework. Students can view these videos in class, at centers, or independently, giving the teacher time to work with smaller groups. And you can use the technology to repurpose class time without solely using video. For example, instead of taking 20 to 25 minutes each week to introduce and review new vocabulary and having students copy definitions to use for a homework activity, students can be paired up, assigned just one or two words, and given 10 to 15 minutes to search the web for various definitions and to find real-world usage instances of these words. The pair then posts the best, most clear definition and a couple examples of real-world usage in an online discussion. This gives everyone in the class a cumulative list of the words, clear definitions, and usage examples. The teacher can then post a few discussion topics and have students reply to each other with their own application of the vocabulary for homework. Instead of sitting and getting, students actively work together as a class to crowdsource the best definitions and usage examples for their vocabulary, and moving parts of this activity to the online classroom saves 10 minutes of class time, which over the course of the year can really add up. To recap, rich technology integration is awesome. Blended learning, also awesome. Both awesome and great together, but not the same thing. Blended learning isn't about the technology, it's about instructional design. The technology is leveraged intentionally to restructure the classroom to increase student involvement, engagement, and input. If we get too caught up in the tools, we miss the whole point. Blended learning is simply about good teaching and making the most of our online and face-to-face -face teaching environments. It's about deliberate and careful instructional planning to put certain activities and content online to take advantage of the opportunities this setting provides and putting other activities in the face-to-face -face setting to leverage the opportunities it provides. It's really about blending these two settings strategically to create the best learning experiences for our learners. Okay, 
So that gives you a picture of what we're looking at with blended learning. It's about using those tools, not for the sake of having technology and tools, but to increase the ability of the teacher to meet the students' needs, for students to collaborate and work online, and to do um, to spend classroom time in more meaningful uh, concept application ways. So what we share with the teachers is that the computer is not going to be the teacher. The teacher still has to bring all of the lesson design and learning and theory and instructional decisions to the, um, the use of technology in there. A teacher is still responsible for checking, for understanding with their students, for having the objectives designed, for really engaging and creating those engaging opportunities for students and bringing her energy or his energy and passion to instruction. So those Four starbursts right there are something that the teacher can bring and only the teacher can bring to that to design instruction. The blue circles um, or squares, rounded squares around the edges, are all instructional design choices. And that's where the teacher has to look at what his or her objective is for that lesson and what is the best format for delivering that instructional opportunity and learning um, to happen. So there are many, and that's not a mutually exclusive list. There are other instructional designs that a teacher could choose from, but only the teacher, again, can really make the decision about for this objective and this purpose, this is the best instructional design for us to choose. It could be a cooperative learning pr project. It could be completely some independent activity that's assigned. It could be a direct instruction lesson that the teacher is walking them through. Just this is the information and learn it because there still is information we need to learn. So the teacher will make that decision. But then the red words that are on the outside brings in that 21st century element where they have to be thinking as they make their instructional design choices, where are the opportunities for collaboration? Where are the opportunities for creativity built in? Where are the opportunities for citizenship, digital citizenship and regular citizenship? Uh, critical thinking, where have I built that into that lesson? Where have I built in collaboration? Where have I connected this to the real world and things that are really happening out there so it's meaningful and relevant? It, blended learning is not the computer as the teacher. And it's not the teacher sitting in front of the classroom while the students just do their work as if he or she were a tutor. Um, it's not online schooling. It's not entirely self-paced. And it's not independent. And right now, we're all in our learning journey, so sometimes we do it better than other times. Some people are much farther along in learning and delivering this instruction than others are. But we all have to start moving along this continuum. And as we have professional development and we continue to work with teachers, we will get better and better and better at doing this. And then when we do this right, we're going to end up with... Um, uh, something that's similar to this graphic image here, that we're going to provide these rich 21st century experiences, and that will allow us to have more time like is shown in this next video. You click on that bottom link. It feels great to get students engaged. Innately, I believe that they're already engaged. And what we're trying to do is just inspire and really make the topics really interesting so students get excited about learning more. We've got robotics, and there's going to be uh, trading games and stock market games. It's going to be amazing. Today, it starts off fun, and it gets even better. Welcome, welcome to the Discovery Lab. You guys excited to be here? Yeah! All right. Well done, well done. So we're really excited to have you here. At Khan Academy, we felt that we needed to have our own version of the summer camp because we had so many ideas that we wanted to test out. What we're really driving towards is individualized and mastery-based learning. One would think that a Khan Academy summer camp could be just kids sitting in front of their computers watching videos. There are videos, and videos are extremely important to help students with self-paced learning. But that goes hand in hand with hands-on projects and activities that really drive the intuition and really get people excited. All answers come to me. The Discovery Lab will include robotics, computer science, mathematical geometry, probability, and economics, and even more things that we'll add in. Based on this, do you think countries should trade with each other? So why, why should they trade with each other? Well, 
Maybe we could trade to prevent wars. Well, you brought an interesting point that a lot of people do bring up between trade and countries, that it often makes the countries more stable. If we're reliant on your country for our food and you're reliant on us for your oil, we're unlikely to go to war with each other because we need each other. You know, it's fascinating. People, people do PhDs on this. You can't learn these things with lectures. You, you have to learn pretty much almost everything. You have to learn by, by doing it, by struggling with it. I mean, because that's what the real world is. The real world, you just engage, you jump into an experience, and your brain starts to draw connections. Your brain starts to struggle with it and says, hey, well, how, how, does this, how does this work? Can I see any patterns here? Can I, can I make any reason out of it? And the other thing that's really important that's not content-based is resilience. These topics are complex topics, and students are going to have to work really hard to be successful, and they just have to try and try again. The summer camp is one of those places where we can allow them to try and try again because we're not set by a particular date where you have to have an examination. We'll say, we'll give you tools to guide you, but you'll have to learn how to figure this out. Right now, we're going to assemble a three-dimensional version of Sopinski's triangle which is a fractal. It's a chance to take a two-dimensional construct and, and go into three dimensions and give the students a chance to sort of experience it in a way that they probably wouldn't if they were just learning about it in a textbook. In school, I've heard about this stuff. I've read about it, but I never did it. But today, I've been doing it, and now I can actually see what it is. It's more interactive, and you're doing more stuff. You're not sitting down with a piece of paper and a textbook doing math problems. It's more fun here. As we get further along, they'll get a chance to see math in a different way because it's more applied, more hands-on. There's something to be said about just doing it with your hands and taking out the conceptual world, even though it doesn't necessarily translate into a immediate increase in test scores or anything like that. It does translate into some level of excitement in the student, and that is something that you don't measure very often, but it's still really important. Discovery Lab, it's a laboratory not only for the kids, but it's also for us at Khan Academy because what's important for us is not to just run a summer camp. What's important is to understand what it is that works. And if we find activities that work really well, we can try it again in a different summer camp or in a different setting. We believe that we can package this together simply so that there's a curated set of projects that are high quality, highly interactive for teachers to immediately be able to use in the classroom. This is all a work in progress. <laughs> Khan Academy is a work in progress. The summer camps are a work in progress over the course of this year, but definitely by next summer. We're going to have summer camps that go much deeper. A summer camp in writing, summer camp in filmmaking, summer camp in, in music. We really want to explore uh, the experiential side of things, not just in the traditional STEM subjects, really across the board. Great. Thank you, everybody. Onward. OK, so um, obviously our schools aren't summer camps. But we, what we're really looking at is bringing all of that together. We want more opportunities if we can help teachers restructure time and how we go about doing it so we can provide more of those activities that were um, exemplified in the Khan Academy summer camp while we're creating meaningful dialogue and um, active learning through technology. We're just that much farther along um, in 21st century learning. So... Keeping all of those things in mind, what we're going to... Now, um, groups. So we'll have two groups of five and one group of six. And I have a blank poster for you. And you're color coded for the DAC committee with brown. So we will have you share your ideas and thoughts that would go into the four If you want to look at the posters to get ideas, you can do that as well. Um, but uh, what we want you to do is to keep that big overall picture in your district-level perspective of what we would like for our students. So let's... Um, Go ahead, and we'll have one, two, three, four, five through Dr. Gill, and one, two, three, four, five, six. Mr. Fulbert, you want to join them? 
and then we'll have one, two, three, four, five. I have a group of markers here, and we'll have you go ahead and just start working. We'll have around 10, 12 minutes to try and put our thoughts on paper, and um, then I have some pins, and we can put them up on the wall and just walk around and see what others have written. And a lot of good brain energy going down. And uh, you got a chance to see the other um, committees and their input, a lot of similarities. And because they were looking through a different lens, there's also some differences. Um, but there's a lot of really great input that we are capturing. And w the site administrators will be doing this at the site with all of their teachers. So all teachers will have input there. And they'll also be doing it with their um, parent groups at the school, so they'll they'll choose the parent group that they think is most well attended to try and capture as many parents as we can. So thank you very much. Okay, let's give Heather uh, one, two, three. Okay, so um, this is the first I get to announce this, and since she jumped up real quick, uh, the uh, the new lead of our grant writing uh, committee, Dr. Gill. She of the $827,000 of career technical ed money. Um, I'd like to have her come up here. And what, what, what Dr. Gill keeps track of is, uh, is making sure that we're kept track of. So um, she's going to explain the process to get to the um, annual review and approval to the board of, of the big ideas that come out of conversations such as this. Good evening. So uh, with the LCAP... Uh, one of our goals is between now and uh, May is um, to review the LCAP that we wrote last year. That's why the data that you saw today, that came out of there. The 21st century learning activity we did today, that came out of there. Career pathways that we talked about, that came out of there. So every single thing we're talking about, uh, like Ma Michael Fullen said, uh, uh, and we, every single thing, single thing that we do go through LCAP. So, so what we really want to do is instead of bringing the big document to you and saying, give us your feedback on this because it won't really mean anything to anybody, we are saying, okay, these are the things we're doing um, in real life. This is what we want to focus on. That's why we bring these type of activities. But we will also bring this type of data not only to this group but to other groups at the school sites, staff members, parents, um, DLAC committees, all those type of things. So that will be our goal. Uh, but instead of saying, give us your an input on the LCAP because that wouldn't really mean anything to anybody, we, our goal is to bring specific surveys like the CT survey um, uh, that we did with the kids that who, who were really aligned to. So we're going to continue doing that. We're also going to do something that is required for of us in the LCAP, which is called annual update. We're going to do our annual update, and then we are going to start working on the next year, which is going to be soon and during month of March, and saying uh, for the real LCAP of 2015-16, then adding three more years after that, uh, what will that look like? We might take some of the data points, some of the things out. We might add other things um, based on what we actually have been doing, uh, what we actually really were able to accomplish this year. And then we'll also exp explain and saying this did really work for us, this didn't work for us. We wouldn't, wouldn't be collecting data on this anymore more because this really didn't, doesn't align with what we're doing, or we will add da data next year on this other piece. Um, so the data points that were targeted for future years are going to be auto-adjusted based on what the actual data points were for this year. Um, so you're going to see um, the data documents that you saw today, different versions of that in, in next year um, as well. So we're going to again write, rewrite the LCAP. Hopefully it won't be 70 pages, it will try to make it simpler and, and shorter this, this time. And uh, then uh, we will be simultaneously working with the County Office of Education, make sure um, that we're meeting their requirements as well while working, working with our stakeholders uh, and receiving everybody's input uh, in, a, in a timely manner. Um, then um, we will take it to public hearing will happen in June 13th, but at that time we also simultaneously work on our budget because budget is a huge part of it as LCAP as well. It's written in the LCAP. So there will be that piece as well where the budget will be approved by the board along with the LCAP. So our goal is to get the LCAP approved by uh, on June 15th, and then we submit it to the county um, right after that. 
Um, so, so there will be a lot more work, um, and there will be more meeting, DAC meetings, but this kind of work that we did today, uh, specifically talking uh, about the LCAP, talking about 21st century classroom, uh, sharing the data, uh, looking at what really worked, what didn't really work, will happen at different meetings at the school side levels and at the district level as well. Questions? Yes. Public hearing is when we the budget will be out there and the uh, um, LCAP will be out there uh, because our LCAP will go out uh, to the uh, board before that uh, for first read. And during public hearing, public can comment on the budget and the LCAP by itself. At, at that point, will the agenda for the board approval meeting have already been established? We'll be able to make any changes or notifications on the agenda since the agenda has to be posted what, two, three days ahead of time or something? So if the meeting's two days before, then you couldn't possibly, right? The public hearing's not going to be relevant, right? Uh, the public hearing, uh, if the public hearing is on the 13th, public hearings is mainly at that point more for the budget, not necessarily the LCAP by itself, because LCAP will be brought forward as the first read meeting before, which will be the first meeting in June. So also, so it works like this. Yes, thank you. So the DAC will be the recommender the, the you know the recommender, so we would bring forward the LCAP revisions uh, at some time before that. Then that would go forward as a oversight committee process. Then it goes forward for the public hearing, which is about the budget. Then board approval. So any discussions about changes? I don't know what you mean by I, I changes. I mean it's uh, it's I it's. Correct. You know, we could, I mean, the whole idea of this is so that essentially everybody knows what's happening before we get there. But if there is, we still have time. It's just Correct. Like no different than the facilities use be, conversation. A major, you know, oh my God. Right. You, could make, you could make minor additions, though, based off stuff in the and and We do that all the time. Correct. So remember that there's about six different committees going on simultaneously, gathering information from stakeholders. So the idea is, um, you know, it, it, it's, it started as a document that was supposed to be an explanation of what we do. Then when the county got involved and the state got involved, then it became a bureaucracy, which is what Dr. Fullen was writing about in the article that we provided tonight. And now it's back to, well, what are we really trying to accomplish? Um, the public hearing, if, and Alvina, remind me, but that was, a, we moved that because... It was, it was screwing up her ability to get the paperwork done for the budget part. So that public hearing is a necessary function of this, but that really, we, we created a special board meeting just to be able to do that. So there's layers of the bureaucratic approval process. So um, any, any input that we're taking right now, we're, we continue to be taking. Does that answer your question? I think so, thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, perfect. I want to thank you. We've been here for a couple of hours. I put a really lot of hard work in, and I do appreciate it. Uh, uh, so uh, we will continue as this process. There will be some shifts and revisions to the LCAP in the enormity of it um, to a more simplified version based on feedback. But the, in essence, we have already approved of the plan, and now we're really looking at the areas we presented tonight. Any, I mean, in other words, last year's plan was approved. Um, the goal was to be able to meet either in, in late March, early April, and see where we stand. Uh, but there's a second meeting with the county this week, and I'll be able to better under, understand that based on that feedback, because it was a little bit of a curveball um, in terms of the simplification process. But we will get that out as soon as we, we have a better understanding. Any other questions? All right, I want to thank all of our presenters and all of you for coming, and uh, Thank you so much for the feedback. It's really great to see. I appreciate it.